Okay, so next we're going to talk about firms, which are one of the main actors that exist in a market or in a capitalist society. Um, and we talked about this in the very first session of the class, where you have different sorts of institutions, you have markets and you have private property and you have firms. And we, we said that firms are kind of the main actor in a capitalist institutional society. Um, and a firm is really just a, an organization that allows people to do stuff. The official uh, definition from CORE was that it, it's an organization or an institution that takes inputs and converts them to outputs and sells them and makes a profit. That's what a firm does. Um, they also do important things like provide um, legal shielding for owners. We mentioned this in the very first session, but this is, this is quite important. Um, if you are a firm owner or a business owner, um, you typically cannot be held personally liable for something that goes wrong. Um, if there's an accident because of your product or whatever, or there's food poisoning that comes from your restaurant. Um, people cannot sue you personally for like your house and your property. Um, they cannot sue your employees for their property and their house and, and things like that. Um, they're kind of shielded by this, this entity of the firm. Um, and so you sue the, the company or you sue the organization instead of the actual people, which means that um, these organizations are more likely to take on risk and to do kind of more research and more development because they're not afraid that they're going to lose their personal wealth and their, their actual property and, and, and things like that um, if there are any mistakes or issues or anything like that. So they're useful for, for legal purposes. Um, firms also employ people. Um, the whole reason like we have jobs is because people are um, hired by firms to do stuff. The stuff that they do is, is this idea of taking inputs and making outputs, either goods or services. So you basically employ people to have them transform stuff into things that you can sell. And the whole idea of having this firm and selling stuff is you want to set the prices higher than the cost of production so that you can make a profit. Um, so fundamentally, that's all a firm is, is doing. It's this legal entity that um, allows people to employ other people. It purchases things, spits out other things, and sells those outputs for higher prices so you can make a profit and, and get money. That's what firms do. Um, firms are interesting, though, because they are not people. Um, they are not individual people. Like Firms don't have indifference curves. They don't have preferences. Um, they're not like individuals, um, they are organizations. And so because of that, organizations run in different ways than how people run. And so decisions within firms are made in different ways. Um, in a market, decisions are made in kind of this magical way. We've been talking about this, this idea of the, the invisible hand. So in a market, choices emerge with no centralized planning. Um, when we talked about the invisible hand in the fir first session, we talked about Skittles, how there's no ministry of Skittles that determines prices for the country. Um, CVS and Walgreens and Kroger and Costco just decide to sell Skittles at whatever price is good. And if they decide to sell it too low, they're going to run out. And so they'll raise their prices. If they raise them too high, they're not going to be able to sell anything. And so they have to lower the prices. And so through this magic of the invisible hand in the market, um, choices about how many Skittles to sell and where to sell the Skittles and things like that, those just kind of emerge with no centralized planning. Um, in firms, this does not happen. Firms are very centrally planned. You have a manager um, who decides where employees should work and what employees should work on. You have boards of directors that tell the manager what to do. Um, they set kind of the central strategy. If you ran a firm like this invisible hand idea where you just say, like, work on whatever you want today, um, the firm's not going to do much. Um, some organizations do this. Google was famous 10 years ago for having this idea of like a 10% project um, where you could spend 10% of your time or 20% of your time on whatever you wanted. Um, and sometimes that emerged, uh, like those projects emerged as useful things. Gmail um, came out of kind of that free time of letting Google employees do whatever they wanted. Um, but nowadays that's not so much a thing. Um, and there's, there's less kind of free time given to just kind of imagine and, and do whatever. Um, because again, as organizations get bigger, you want to have like a central focus and a central strategy. And so you have central planning that, that helps do that. 
Um, and so what's interesting here is that in the world of organizational behavior and, and economics, um, people have been theorizing about this forever. Um, one famous quote here about markets is that the market is the very Eden of the innate rights of man. That's where you find freedom and equality and property. Um, and so as people are bumping around into each other, um, then that's where you're free to choose whatever you want and everybody's kind of equal. Everybody has equal access to Skittles and other products. Um, uh, so goes this theory here. In firms, um, kind of the classical definition of, of how firms work is if a workman moves from one department to another, it's not because the prices change, but it's because a manager told them to do that. Um, so again, this is the idea of central planning here. Um, the fun part about these two quotes here, though, is this first quote about the market being kind of the Eden of the innate rights of man comes from Karl Marx, who's famous for um, like his uh, anti-capitalist writings and, and communism. Um, but in his definition of this market here, um, this is he likes markets because this is where people have access to to buy things and to sell things and, and kind of act on an equal playing ground um, within this market. Firms, on the other hand, this famous quote here is from um, a guy named Ronald Coase, um, who is a very famous um, economist who was very, very, very much in favor of the free market and um, kind of more libertarian principles of the economy and minimizing government intervention in the economy and minimizing central planning. But within firms, central planning is necessary. And so it, this is kind of a fun little reversal of roles here um, where you have Marx arguing that markets are great and you have Coase saying central planning is great, but it's because they're talking about opposite things. Um, firms for coasts need to be centrally planned so that they are efficient, but markets should not be. Um, Marx said this in, in uh, Das Kapital, where he wrote about um, the Communist Manifesto and other Marxist principles here. Um, what Marx ended up saying here is that within a capitalist system, even though you have markets where everybody can do whatever they want and there's ultimate freedom and it's the Eden of the rights of man, um, what he says is that this idea is actually an illusion um, because of firms, where firms within these markets, their whole goal of life is not to um, produce rights and freedom, but it's to um, essentially rent workers and use up their labor so that they can benefit um, the, the capitalist class. Um, and so that was the whole point of firms in his world, where like, markets are great, but these firms are not acting in the best interest of the people they're employing. Um, and the whole structure is set up in a way that makes it so that the workers, um, the, ben the product and the, the, the output of these workers don't really go directly to the workers. It goes to the, the landowners and the, um, the firm owners. And so people aren't benefiting directly from their labor. Um, and so that's one consequence of having kind of centrally planned firms with um, incentives that aren't perfectly, perfectly aligned with their workers. Coase, on the other hand, um, loves this idea of, of firms working in a market. Um, and his argument here is that um, because working in a market is tricky, like it naturally leads to firms emerging. So if we go back to the Skittles idea, you could make your own Skittles at home, um, but that's going to be really expensive um, because you're going to want to specialize in like one aspect of Skittle making. And so you're going to need to work with other people to get like the cane sugar and the food coloring and the candy coating and all of the other things so that they can all work together. And so that kind of naturally leads into this idea of a cooperative economy where you have different people specializing in things, which then naturally leads to the idea of having a firm that can do that. And so you're protected legally from if you mess up with your candy coating and you can hire people to help with the candy coating. And so that just kind of what he argues is this this firm idea kind of naturally bubbles up in a market and it makes the market more efficient because now you have these firms that are specializing in getting really good at making candy coating and cane sugar and food coloring. Um, and then they can combine their forces and create lots more Skittles than one person could do on their own. And so according to Coase, it's great that you have these firms that are emerging and gaining lots of power and, and ordering their workers around because it's great for the market. Marx was very anti that idea. Um, Coase was very pro that idea. 
Um, so to kind of summarize this, this principle here, um, from the, the ESPP reading that you had for today, um, essentially the, the weird thing about this, this idea of a firm is that within capitalism where we care about a free market, invisible hand, no control over what's happening, the firm is basically a mini centrally planned economy within a free market where everything is very centralized. You do have a ministry of Skittle production within the Mars company itself, within the candy companies. They decide how much stuff they're making because they have um, chief financial officers and chief technology officers, and they have like people observing how things are being bought. And so within the firm itself, everything is very highly centrally planned. They tell their workers what to do and they do them. Um, but in the free market, that's not how it works. Um, another um, analogy for this comes from D.H. Robertson, another economist from a while ago, um, where he calls firms islands of conscious power in an ocean of unconscious cooperation. So the market is this ocean of unconscious cooperation where people are just bumping into each other, invisible hand is taking care of prices magically. Um, and the islands of conscious power are the firms basically being like miniature dictatorships um, and controlling what's happening within the firm so that they can be more efficient in kind of the greater ocean of the free market. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic here between firms and markets where we have free markets, but we have very highly centralized firms that have clear organizational structures and essentially, again, many dictatorships, um, which is, is an odd thing to think about. Um, so if we look briefly here at how firms are structured, a typical private sector company is structured something like this, where there's a board of directors um, that sets the main strategy for the organization. They're also the owners. Um, they're the shareholders if, if it's a private or if it's a publicly traded company. And so they're the ones who decide what the company should do or what the firm should do. They communicate with the manager here um, and they essentially dictate to the manager, you should do this. And so we have this, this gray arrow going down saying, the board decides this should be our new strategic, strategic direction. And then the manager tells the workers what to do. Um, and so you see more gray arrows down here where the manager says, workers work on this new product. Um, and so the, the orders, the strategy itself comes from the board and the owners and the shareholders to the manager and then to the workers. But if you notice in this, in this graphic here, there are also arrows that go up, um, these green dashed arrows. And what gets really interesting here is these dashed arrows are incomplete. Um, the manager reports back to the board of directors, but the board does not see everything that the manager does. And so they just get kind of regular reports. They can kind of see what's happening, but it's not like a complete oversight over what's happening. Same thing here with the workers and the managers. The manager can't see every single thing that the worker is doing. That's impossible. Um, and so there's incomplete information going back up this chain within the organizational structure. And that's the case for all sorts of organizations. Um, it's not just private companies. It's basically any company that has um, lots of people in it or any organization that has lots of people in it. It will naturally kind of have this flow of information or flow of direction down and flow of information back up. That's how organizations work. So in a private company, the ownership is at this level here. These are the shareholders. Um, these are like if it's a family run business, this is the family. Board of directors are kind of the main owners of the organization. Strategy gets set by the board of directors. Managers do have some say in strategy, but off, most often it's the board that decides what the firm should be working on next and their great visions and strategies and things like that. And then that gets passed on down to the workers. The implementation of the strategy does not come from here. These guys are not responsible for making sure the thing happens. The manager is and the workers are. And so this relationship is very important for getting stuff done, um, which makes a very interesting tension here where you have these people deciding what should happen and telling the manager and then the manager telling or receiving that information and then telling the workers what to do. Um, and so there's some built in tension there. And we'll talk about that in the next section, how you can make sure um, that things continue to work um, with these green arrows going back with, with um, imperfect information. Um, so this is a typical uh, private sector organization. 
not all organizations look like this. Um, if we look at the public sector or the nonprofit sector, it actually works slightly differently. So nonprofits, they have a board of directors, but they are not the owners. There are no owners for nonprofit organizations. The owners are technically the public. Um, a public charity like a 501c3 does not have shareholders. The profits do not go back to um, the owners of the organization. There are no owners. Um, it's just the public trust that, that gets the benefit of having the charity working. And so, there are, again, there's no ownership, but the same principles apply here where you have a board that sets the strategy um, and then they talk to the executive director or the manager that deals with the day-to-day -day operations of the nonprofit. And then that nonprofit, then that manager, the executive director, then talks to the different workers or the volunteers or the people who actually do the implementing of what the board wants. So nonprofits work that way. Governments work kind of similarly. Um, governments also do not have owners. Um, the, any profits that governments make don't go back to um, the shareholders. Um, it just kind of goes back to the public trust and like what like general society. Um, but you still have kind of a board of directors. Um, depending on the level of government, that could be um, elected officials, um, a city council who is elected by the public. And so this is technically another level here. We have the public who then elects the board of directors or the city council or Congress or a state legislature who then decides the um, strategic direction of the governmental unit who then works with the professional bureaucrats um, and the heads of different departments in the government who then have employees that work for them. And so in a government, you kind of have the fourth level up here of, of voters who then tell the elected officials what to do in theory, and then they tell the bureaucrats what to do, and then they tell the workers what to do. So it's, it's slightly different than what we have in kind of a traditional firm, but the, the ideas are similar, where you have different ways of inf or information flowing between different levels. You have natural tension between some of these levels, um, a lack of communication, a lack of oversight. And so that leads to um, interesting outcomes um, in um, what might happen um, and how effective the organization is. And so organiza organizations have to grapple with this all the time where to allocate different um, types of, uh, of power and, and say within an organization. Um, one really interesting case study of this is Amnesty International. They're one of the, the biggest human rights organizations in the world. They're a nonprofit that's based in London. Um, and they have field offices throughout the world. They have different branches. Um, any country that wants to kind of create their own branch of Amnesty can. Um, we have Amnesty United States based in Washington, D.C. There's Amnesty all over the world. And one reason they are so effective is because they have figured out a way to structure their organization here in a way that makes it so there's good communication between the different levels. Um, but there's also flexibility in the different levels. And so what Amnesty has done is they've recognized that they have three different types of power within the organization. There's proposal power, which is the ability for someone in the organization to propose a new strategy, to say, we need to tackle this new human rights issue, um, some sort of new campaign that they want to, to engage in. And so that, that they have proposal power. You have enforcement power, which is the ability to check on other branches and check on other divisions and make sure they are doing what was supposed to be done. And so if you're leading some new human rights campaign, um, having enforcement power means monitoring the different campaigns that are happening, um, making or holding them accountable, making sure the, the, the program is actually happening. And then you have implementation power, which is the ability to do the thing. Um, to figure out how to implement a new program or a new strategy in the country that you work in. And so these three different types of power, one thing that has made Amnesty so, so effective, um, based on a whole bunch of different studies of, of its organizational structure, is that it has separated these different powers at different levels. So with proposal and enforcement, they've centralized this power in London. So the main office in London is responsible for proposing new strategies um, and for enforcing those strategies. And so they say, globally, we are interested in these issue areas and you all should go figure out how to do this and we'll monitor and make sure it's happening. 
And so they're the ones who are proposing things and they're the ones who are enforcing things. But they also decentralize their implementation power. So rather than telling Amnesty France or Amnesty US or Amnesty whoever how to actually do the proposal, they say, you guys go figure it out. Um, we give you the power to implement this thing. And so as a result, the people who are closer to um, the issues on the ground have the ability to be flexible and to adjust the programming as needed. Um, so it works well. And so if we look back at this organizational structure here, um, essentially the board is setting policy and it is making and it's monitoring that policy through the manager here. But then the manager and the workers, they can do whatever they want to make sure that that is working. And so that works well. This seems really intuitive and like, yes, everybody should do that. Um, but lots of organizations don't do this. And this might not be the most effective way to run every single organization. There are some organizations that pride themselves in being very democratic and allowing any worker to have the ability to propose new strategy. And so workers can send their ideas up to the board and say, we think we should do this. Um, and then like you can move that that proposal power or the implementation power or the um, enforcement power at different levels of this and it's going to work more or less effectively depending on how the organization is structured but it's it's something that you should pay attention to um, when you're managing organizations is figure out um, where the different power lies in the different levels of the organization and how to best and most effectively make that information flow correctly and make it so that people have the flexibility to implement those things um, and so again these are core economic principles but it applies very very well to kind of organizational behavior and how you run effective organizations.